In many different textbooks on calculus, a vibrating spring is treated as an example. So why is this example always taken? Well, from an applicational point of view, this is an interesting example. Many structures can be modeled as springs or as combinations of vibrating springs. And from a calculus point of view, this is also a nice example. A vibrating spring can be modeled by a second order linear differential equation, and we just learned how to solve those. So let us see how a spring is modeled in this video. We have our spring over here in yellow and some mass attached to it, and we let the uh, mass move in the plane, so no gravity here. We denote the uh, position of the spring uh, as x, uh, the position with respect to its equilibrium position, so x equals zero if the spring is in equilibrium, just, uh, the mass just lies on the table. And then we see what kind of forces do we have. Well, if we have some positive x, spring pulls back, so we have a spring force Fs, which is modeled as minus k times x, where k is some constant. Well, this is called Hooke's law. It only applies if x is not too big. Of course, if you have a very, very large x, then your spring just breaks down and deforms. So uh, this is fine as long as your x is not too big. And then we have to uh, model the friction, of course. And we model the proportional to V, so the, uh, we model the friction with the air. Uh, a friction force equals minus C times V. So we neglect the uh, friction with the surface. As a good approximation, well, if you would put your mass on ice or something like that, usually uh, the, the friction with the, the surface, with the rough surface, is bigger than the fr friction with the air. However, from a calculus point of view, this is nicer because if we model the friction like this, we, have an, we will get a nice second order linear differential equation which we can solve. If you would include uh, the, the friction with the, uh, the, with the ground, with the surface, then the differential equation, the resulting differential equation becomes a bit more difficult to solve. So, okay, could have taken a bit more realistic friction, but well, certainly the friction with air is there. So that's our model. Now, what, then, what do we know? We know the sum of the forces F total equals mass times acceleration. We have two forces, spring force and friction force, so mass times acceleration becomes minus C times V minus K times X, both uh, opposing uh, the movement, pulling it back. Then we know A equals V prime and V equals X prime, so we know acceleration equals X double, and if you plug everything in, we get m times x double plus c times x prime plus k times x equals zero, where m mass, c uh, friction constant and k uh, uh, spring constants are all constants. So we have a linear second order differential equation with constant coefficients. So what happens, for example, if we solve it without friction, so the c equals zero case? Well, in that case, we get x prime plus k over m times x equals zero. Uh, we define a new constant, omega equals the square root of k over m, so omega squared equals k over m, so we get x plus omega squared times a, uh, uh, x double uh, plus omega squared times x equals zero, and we can solve for x. x equals c1 times the cosine of omega t plus c2 times the sine of omega t. We can even uh, rewrite this a bit to, uh, to get one cosine, so then we get x of t is some amplitude 2 times cosine of omega t plus phi. So how do we do that? How do we find a and phi in terms of c1 and c2 and y? First, how can we find them? Well, you can rewrite a times the cosine of omega t plus phi as a times uh, work out this formula with cos omega t cos phi minus sine omega t sine phi. So the formula for cos a plus b equals cos a cos b minus sine, sine a sine b. And then we compare, we see the a times cosine phi equals c1 and the a times minus sine phi equals c2. So we can express a and sine phi in terms of c1 and c2. 
I want to solve for a in terms of c1 and c2. Well, uh, square and sum up, you get a squared equals c1 squared plus c2 squared. So that's how we can find a once you have c1 and c2 uh, as a square root of c1 squared plus c2 squared. And then uh, phi is determined by the, uh, the equation by dividing by a cos phi equals c1 over a and sine phi equals minus c2 over a. So that's how you could determine your phi. So why would you do that? I mean, you already have your solution uh, in terms of C1 and C2, so why would you write it uh, like this? Well, if you write it like this, you can more clearly see what happens. This A is basically the amplitude of your solution. So the A has an interpretation in terms of amplitude, and phi is just some shift, some phase angle, some shifting angle, but especially the amplitude is interesting. So uh, here we, uh, we saw how we can move a, sp a vibrating spring, and we already solved it fully. In the case there's no friction.